Thanksgiving time together at 1 o'clock after the second service we'll be getting together. Bring a dish to pass if you have, and if you don't have a dish to pass, come and fellowship with us. Hallelujah. Uh, our friend Owen Carey, he will be here next week, and we have also a combined service at 10 o'clock. Mm -hmm. 10 o'clock, one service. All right? Combined. There we go. Good morning, uh, and of course, we have our encounter night. That is on uh, Saturday on the 16th. Come and encounter Jesus. All right. Bring your friends, bring unbelievers, bring your neighbors, bring the doubters, the haters. Bring them. Yeah, bring them. Bring them. <laughs> Come on. Bring them. I keep trying to bring my husband. He's like his feet are glued to the floor, but we're going to bring him one day to a house. Amen. Amen. Oh, amen. And if there's anyone in the, oh, thank you. If there's anyone at the service today, if you feel like you can help us for a counter night, we need some help with the slides. Um, so, you know, the words to the music will be coming up, and we need someone to push that button and be aware of, of uh, the verses in the song. So if you're able to help, Encounter Night is next Saturday. It starts at 7, but if you could be here at 6, or raise your hand and volunteer to help out, that would be a wonderful, wonderful thing. Is that our camera? Yeah, it is. There it is. Oh, hey! <laughs> 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 you are a blessing. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yes. And <laughs> so uh, usually at this time we'll have a TNT that's a uh, uh, tithe and testimony. And we have our friend and sister in Christ, Elizabeth. Elizabeth. <laughs> No, you do a good job. Give her some encouragement. Good job, Olivia. We love it. We love it when you just bring your sassy self out. That's what we love. <laughs> All right, for our TNT, um, for the month of November, we've just been sharing some thankfulness and some honor for people who have been with us, committing heart and soul for a really long time and really not looking for anyone to notice them, not looking for appreciation, but we want to honor them and we want to tell them how much we're thankful for them. So the first one I'm doing today is Leif, who's currently serving right now during the slide. So Leif has been with this ministry since the launch, and 
and she's been with us in heart even before that when she was attending other churches but she in heart was like telling Nate and Carrie when you guys get going I'm there <laughs> um, and her hands have helped in almost every ministry area because she's the person who always steps in when there's a need whether she knows how to do that thing or not she's willing to learn and she'll say I'll figure it out <laughs> She's always willing to learn, and she's asking the question at all times, how can I help? She has a face um, that is genuine, and she just in every way is always loving and serving people around her. She's willing to make mistakes and even take the chance to look like a fool, even though that's never happened. But she'll take the chance with her heart saying, I'm in the right place because if what I do blesses another person, it's worth it. Um, she has helped with countless events and was one of the first people brave enough to talk in our hot mic during our services when Pastor Nate started encouraging us as a people to step out and say, whatever you feel like the Lord is leading you to say, come say it. And she was like the first one that was like, okay, <laughs> I'll try it. <laughs> Oh my goodness, she's um, learned the soundboard and the slides, she serves in production, and she recently um, volunteered to help with the kids' ministry, which I'm really excited about, because she has amazing things to give and serve with our kids, and she's just a joy. Um, so she's an example of a genuine heart before the Lord um, that cannot be accused of being fake, and she regularly blesses us with scripture and prompting from the Holy Spirit, and she's a demonstration of how to be vulnerable, take risks, and bless others inside and outside these doors. So thank you, Lee. Yeah. 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 All right. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I'll give it to all of them at the end. Um, uh, Cindy here. Cindy's here. You are here. Hi, oh, you are. Hi, Cindy. Cindy's our next person. Oh my goodness, Cindy has been a dedicated member of Vision Church before the church launched as well. She was one of the people meeting in Pastor Nate's house when we were just doing like living room church and right. posting it live stream. And we were like, hey, if someone signs on, great. <laughs> and Cindy was there in our living room worshiping the Lord with us and praying with us um, in the middle of COVID. And she's been faithfully giving towards this ministry before we even had a building. Um, just tithing towards what the Lord had and the vision that the Lord had mm -hmm. and planting seeds of righteousness and abundance where there was nothing but a dream. Mm -hmm. She comes and cleans the space every week to make it comfortable and for you to feel like you can come and worship the Lord and not be distracted by a, like a smelly, stinky, gross space. <laughs> she makes it comfortable for us. Um, and she's helped me in the nursery since the very start. And she's demonstrated some of the most faithful and humble service that we've seen. She sees others who do not see, who we do not see. And she is a tender and giving heart towards the brokenhearted, the weak, and the poor. Cindy, we love and appreciate your dedication. And God blesses you for all you do. Give Cindy a hand. And our last one's Lydia for today. Lydia is a newer member in comparison to the others that I was talking about today, but there's no questioning her dedication and her passion and her love for God's people. Lydia brings a motherly presence to all that she encounters, and she fills the space with joy of the Lord. She's leading our prayer meetings every Wednesday. She faithfully prays with our, prays with our altar team. And she served on the worship team before, and she works behind the scenes with many acts of hospitality. She models a passionate love for Jesus with her testimonies and prayers and worship, and she keeps her eyes open to those who might go unnoticed, and she tries to bless them in any way she can. She's given faith in faith countless times to the ministry on, on top of her tithing. And she demonstrates a kingdom model of open-handedness with her finances. Yes. Lydia takes attendance for us, and <clears throat> she also like organizes who's opening the worship time, and, like when we have people praying for our service and sharing a scripture. She's the one that's making sure that happens. 
And we just, we really appreciate you, Lydia, and everything you do. Even though so many might not notice what you're doing, we notice it, and God notices it, and it's meaningful to him. So we love you, Lydia. <laughs>
embarrassed of or scared of. It's something to honor. And so everybody in the room this morning, I want you to just stretch out your hands and we're just going to honor. And I just want to uh, first preface this with, uh, I went to uh, elementary school. Uh, John's school was doing a Veterans Day ceremony, I walked in through the doors and I saw a bunch of kids his age waving the American flag. And there was a song playing, uh, what's that song, it, it, like a country one? God bless the USA. God bless the USA. You guys know that one? And I was so moved and laughed. I just had a smile on my face the whole time. And some random kid gave me a card that they made for me. And then I saw my old military photo up on the wall. And I was like, man, we got to tear that thing down. That looks terrible. <laughs> I've got this grouchy, you know, they said, don't smile. And so I got this tough guy, you know, you know, just out of boot camp photo stuck on the wall. And it was like the biggest one on the wall. <laughs> Like this big. Everybody had these little three by five things. And, and, but it was cool. It was cool. And then they sang, it was a very patriotic kind of experience. And they had a bunch of vets sitting on the side. And man, when they, they were passing the mic around for us to just kind of share our name and what service we were in. And I kind of screwed that up and I forgot what I was going to say. And, and I got nervous in front of the kids and everything. And But man, I went away with a, with a sense of. We need to bless the vets. We need to be thankful for where we are as a country. And irregardless of what America hasn't done right, focusing on that fixes nothing. If you do not love your country, you will destroy it. You will tear it down. You will, you will be the worst citizen ever. Because the things you love and the people you love, you pour into, you strengthen, you encourage, you endorse. And so one of the things we need to do is we need to love our vets. Because it came at a cost. No matter what they did, whether they were in, you know, out there on the front line and in combat, or they were just serving in a motor pool, uh, working on the vehicles, being in the military is sacrificial. Yeah, they're paying you. They don't pay you enough. It's sacrificial. And so I just want us to just pray that for that, for that sacrifice and just honor these guys here this morning. So Jesus, we thank you for being our commander in chief, for your kingdom. We ask that your kingdom would come and your will would be done in our vets, in this room and across America. That we would see a move of Jesus in them because you say that you will go before us and that you are our rear guard. And that in the combat, in the, in the military uh, formations, in the training, uh, out in the field, in the motor pool, all the different places and times, you are still present, watching and protecting. And so God, we ask that you would just bring healing, strength, restoration, and favor to our veterans. That they would be treated honorably honorably, that we would honor them as a people, as a nation, not just on a once a, you know, one day a year type of thing, but in a way that there's a fact, God bless them, because they sacrificed, they, they, they came back, they experienced things, saw things, and did things that changed their lives, and so Lord, I ask that you would bring redemption into the dark places, and you would bring uh, even uh, great testimonies to the good as well. That you would work those things for good and that today we would be different. We would understand and see where you were in those conflicts and in those times and in that sacrifice. And we ask God that uh, maybe even if we weren't doing it for you at the time, Lord, that you would just bless them and honor the sacrifice for the pursuit of righteousness, for the pursuit of the defense of others, for the pursuit of, of protecting a nation under God. And that we believe, Jesus, that you still are the foundation of this nation, that it is founded on Christian biblical principles, the rule of law, the pursuit of happiness, a people under God, not under 
a dictatorship, not under an authority that overextends its arms, but under God, because you are the creator. And so I pray that you would heal wounds. I pray that you would encourage and nurture us in a way only you can. What we have experienced, what they have experienced, and to the families, to those who uh, lost loved ones, because the families were impacted God, the same blessing poured on them because they sacrificed with us and with them.
is our kids. Come on, kids, say it. Holy Spirit, come and fill me. I want your joy. I want your love. I just want you.
to give up our lives. That's what we're trying to teach the kids. Before they get too old, before they start thinking that they're supposed to be running the show. So if, if you have walked from Jesus, if you've turned away, if you have not laid down your life to him, because the Bible says that if you seek to save your life, you will lose it. But if you will lose your life for my sake, then you will find it. You see, we have to die to ourselves. We have to give up our life, our human efforts, our plans, our agenda, so that we can get his dream and plan. It's how it's been since the foundation of the world, since people were walking on this rock-cold earth. They have needed Jesus. And so if that's you, if you need to repent and that you need to come back, because you took control, you, you took the throne of your life, you took the steering wheel, and you said, I know what to do. I know what I'm supposed to be doing. I know where I'm going. I'm not going to have anybody tell me that is pride. And you don't know what tomorrow has. Tomorrow has not been given to you. You don't know what's to come other than that Jesus is coming back. And he's not coming back for people. He's coming back for a bride. He's coming back for his church. He's coming back for those who have called him Lord. And Lord means master boss. He's the boss. He owns you. He owns everything in your life. And if he does it, that's a dangerous place. And so right now, every eye closed. I'm not going to make you come up front or anything, but I just want you as an act of faith, I want you to raise your hand towards Jesus this morning. If you've taken the wheel, if you've taken the throne of your life, if you've never accepted Jesus, or maybe you did, but you know what? You backslid a little bit. If that's you, I want you to raise your hand. We're just going to pray a prayer, and we're going to move on. Jesus, for all those who have lifted hands, we right now ask you to take the throne of their life once again. Bear witness in their hearts that they are your children, that you love them. Show them your love this morning. And take the wheel. Jesus, take the wheel. Take the throne that has only been built for you. For you are the king of kings. There is no king, no name, no person, no being higher than you. And be the Lord of our lives over these lives. Seal them with the Holy Spirit. Mark them for you and reveal your glory to them, to the oldest and to the youngest. There have been many times in my life where I had to do this kind of prayer because I got comfortable, because I got hopeless, and I thought, you know what? I tried Jesus. That's the problem. You can't try Jesus. It's a marriage covenant. You're either in covenant or you're not. It's a contractual covenant. Either I am for him and all in him, I'm all in, or I'm not in. So Jesus, we just ask that you would give us faith, release faith this morning, that we would walk in covenant relationship to you, that we would move past the rules and obligations and ideas and plans and strategies into the simplicity of following Jesus.
And that this isn't just crackers and juice. It's a holy sacrament. So once again, if, if you're not right with Jesus...
garment, which is this covering for your sin. Your sin. Maybe somebody sinned against you and, and then you sinned and you blame them. No, it's your sin. You have to take responsibility for what you chose to do. When you were five years old, when you were 10, when you were 18, when you were 30, the record is still there. It doesn't matter how long ago it was. If you went before a judge, they'd pull your file. Well, someday you're going to stand before the king of kings and the judge of the world. The judge who's going to judge the angels at the famous feet of Christ Thank mm -hmm. you. 
singing for you, are you? Are you worried, really worried about who's standing next to you this morning? You're in the house of God. He's the judge. And he loves it when you shout for him. He loves it when you praise his name. I tell you, there's something about praising the Lord. And it's the word says he inhabits the praises of his people. There's just a different manifestation when you praise God. When you lift him up. When you cast off your, somebody looking at me. That's self-centered. That's not worship. That's not worship. Amen. Thank you, worship team. Get ready, kids. Squirrel! 
Squirrel, the dog forgot every principle, took off and dragged the man down the street. The point is, we can all know good principles, but without relationship guiding us, we're just one squirrel away. We're just one squirrel away from getting dragged away, falling down, and looking silly. Because you got all the commands. I've been keeping all the commandments since my youth. Listen, relationship rules the rules. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus, the Ten Commandments will improve your quality of life, but you will always live under the weight that you've never managed to get them all right. You're always going to be one step away of screwing up. You're always going to be worried about what people think and how they are judging you, and you're going to be judging yourself more than you should be judging yourself. Relationship rules, relationship to Jesus. The Bible says that Jesus did not come to abolish the law, but to... Fulfill it. In 2 Corinthians 3, I hope you're there. You know, maybe you got your Bible on here. That's great. Christianity, hear me, Christianity is not a set of principles or moral code. It's a relationship. There is a moral code, but it is not what makes up being a Christian. It is a call to an intimate relationship with Jesus. To truly live as a Christian, we must go beyond rules and walk closely with Jesus. When you walk closely to Jesus, you will fulfill the commandments. He who says he loves God but does not keep my commandments is a liar. Okay, so we're not getting rid of the commands. We're trying to empower you. I want you to be empowered this morning to understand that if you're trying to clean up your life to go to church, you'll never get there. Because it's not your job. Consider the Ten Commandments and how they are fulfilled by the first and greatest commandment. What is the first and greatest commandment? Jesus said, you shall Right. Right. And your neighbor as yourself. So the first and greatest commandment is to love God. Why? Because if you will love God, you will keep his commands. What you love, you will embrace, support, become like. But if you're dreading, this is why the disciples could say, we love his commandments and they are not burdensome to us. How can that be? Because you have relationship. You get the Holy Spirit, the Holy, Holy Spirit. You get the Holy Spirit, it pushes out all the unholy things. I've seen where people, there was a story, we got much to get in here, and I'm running out of time. This service is going long. There was, there was a man who came up for prayer one time to me, not here, and he wanted to quit chewing tobacco. He's like, I'm addicted, I can't quit, I got a can in my pocket right now, and I want to stop, and I can't, and I said, okay, there's the prerequisite. Jesus is the solution? Yes. Can't quit? Yes. Awesome. I love that faith. I can't quit. He's not, he's saying, I can't quit. He's not saying I can't, God can't help me quit. He's not saying God doesn't have the source and power to get me to quit. He's saying I tried and I can't. There's important to notice the difference in what they're saying there. Some of us might be quick. Oh no, no, you can't. He wasn't saying it that way. He was saying I can't, but I want to. So we prayed and I said in the just simple prayer, Jesus, we break this addiction of nicotine in the name of Jesus. And in agreement, we just declare that you can break this addiction and that he is free. And that's all it was. He got no goosebumps. There was no jitters. There was no, there was no physical manifestation. But he went out in his car at the end of the service and left 
And the next Sunday, he told me that when he went out of the church and he let it got into his car and he instinctually reached down because he had cans of tobacco everywhere, right? If you drink, you got booze everywhere. If you smoke, you got smokes it because you, you know what's in your pocket might run out. And there's a, there's a fear or an anxiety that, you know, I might start, you know, needing to get a recharge, juiced up a little bit. I need some sauce because I'm getting a little salty. You know, and so they'll drink, they'll smoke, whatever. He, he said, Pastor, I got in, I grabbed my chewing tobacco out of the console in the door, and I grabbed some and I threw it in my mouth, and all of a sudden, this disgust. Cause I felt like I was going to puke. I rolled down the window and I spit it out. I almost spit it all over my door and I haven't touched it since. He changed his wiring. He changed his wiring because relationship rules. His relationship took supremacy through the name of Jesus over his addiction. And he goes... I didn't get any shakes. I didn't get, I didn't even crave it anymore. But he had a habit. Wait, I don't actually need this anymore. So he gave me some of his stuff and he threw the rest away and then I threw it away. And I don't use that. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Verse 4. And we have such trust through Christ towards God, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God, who has made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit, for the letter kills, but the spirit gives Life. Jesus said in John 15, I am the vine, you are the branches. If anyone remains in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. Now this is a challenge because we say, well, I'm a Christian, I identify as a Christian. Yes, but are you abiding in him? Are you? Do you believe that in your own strength and ability, it is never going to be enough to do what God wants you to do? You need to say amen to that. You need to believe that you have what you need to do what God wants you to do, but you and of yourself, by yourself, are never going to be enough. Amen. The Pharisees strictly followed religious rules, but they missed the essence of knowing God. Jesus talked about this. He rebuked them. He says, you tithe mint, and you do all these things, and you upheld all the laws and everything. But inwardly, you are whitewashed tombs. You look great on the outside, but inside you're full of dead men's bones. You're so pious and religious, but you don't know the Father. Oh, we're the sons and we're the sons of Abraham. No, you're the children of the devil. He called them the children of the devil. Because on the outside, they looked like they had it together and they were religious and everybody knew well, that's a Pharisee. But inside, they were just always looking at who to judge, who to condemn, who's doing it right. It was all that was full of their heart. Why? Because they were living in a place of condemnation themselves. They followed the law strictly. They added laws to the laws to the laws. That's why they were always in conflict with Jesus. Because Jesus would uphold the spirit of the law. He would go over to the woman and he would forgive her for her sin. And the Pharisees are holding rocks ready to kill her in the street where she stands. Because they did not understand. Go and learn this and understand. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. He would say this to them. He would correct them and rebuke them. And they didn't get it. Because they did not have relationships. Start your day 
day with personal prayer and scripture. Connect with Jesus. Start treating Jesus like he actually hears you, that he's actually present, he's actually real. I said it to the, this morning in, in the uh, uh, prayer time. Wake up with good morning, Jesus. Start your day with a personal prayer and scripture reading, not because you have to, because you get to. You get to hear, I get to hear from Jesus today. You will have, I'm telling you, something changes inside of you. You, 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 you're like, you start craving the next time you get to open your Bible. And it's not natural. It's supernatural. Read, connect, try to, don't look at your devotion time as a checklist. Don't obsess. From this, you know what will happen? You want to be obsessing over the rules or how you appear or whether you're getting everything right. Because you know you're right with him because you're abiding in him because you're spending time loving on him and he's loving on you. Think about it. When you know somebody loves you and cares about you, you're pretty comfortable around those people. But when somebody is not right, when you're not right with somebody, you spend a lot of time worrying about what they're saying, thinking, or doing, don't you? Because you're in the place of condemnation. You're worried about whether they're judging me, what they're saying, what they're doing. That's not the place of love. See, I can relate this to people because people are people. are people. And our relationship with Jesus, that's why he came fully as a man so that we can relate. Talk to Jesus through the day. Why? Because if you want to be like a Pharisee, memorize this, learn this, but without relationship, You'll just become an ugly rule book. You will be a rule referee. You ever been around, around somebody who's always pointing out how you're doing something wrong? That's a person not living under grace. Because he who has been forgiven much loves much. When you reflect on yourself, you don't want to step into place of judging and critiquing people because you don't want to reap what you're sowing. For with the measure you use, it shall be measured unto you. It's not to say that we can't judge things that are right and wrong. It's to say, careful. Careful, because there's one judge. Rules, another thing rules do is they remove authenticity. Rules will make you fake. Because you will be like a Pharisee. On the outside, you look like you got it all together. But on the inside, you're a crumbled mess. And you can't tell anybody because you got a rule. I'm supposed to be happy all the time. The joy, how you doing? Great, brother, God bless, I'm great. And they put on the fake smile and they put on, you know, and I, yeah, I believe it, I'm pressing on through. Meanwhile, they would just stop and just say, you know, I am terrible, I am terrible. They have no idea what just happened to me. I need somebody to pray for me. I need somebody to intercede for me. I need to see Jesus and experience Jesus today because I'm not okay. It's okay to not be okay. Job had a bad day, amen? Yeah. Yeah. You think Jesus had some hard times? Anybody here ever sweat blood under the stress they were under? Not me. Point number two, relationship brings transformation, not modification. Well, the Bible says I'm supposed to do this. Okay, let me stop doing that. Okay, but without conviction of the Holy Spirit, good luck. You're, you're going to need some kind of luck if there's such a thing, which I don't really believe there is, but I think you understand the phrase. Transformation. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if anyone is a new in Christ, in Christ, he said, Abide in me and you will bear much fruit. There's an abiding in Jesus. There's a spending time with Jesus that changes you. And the only effort you're bringing is protecting the time that you're spending with him. There's your effort. There's your good work. The Bible says that 
The Pharisees and the Sadducees recognized that the disciples were with Jesus, that they were disciples of Jesus because of what they understood and said and did. They didn't even say, I'm a Jesus follower, I'm the follower of the way. That's one of the titles they had back then. They were called Christians initially. Those followers of the way, they perceived that they were disciples of Jesus. There was just something different about them. Zacchaeus is a great example. In Luke 19, he lived a life driven by self-interest and wealth. And after encountering Jesus, he, did, he didn't just adopt new principles. Jesus came to his house and dined with him, and something changed. And he, he changed, and he's like, I'm, he just wanted to repent. There's nothing in the text. Jesus never once corrected him, rebuked him, or poured it out his fault. In fact, he sat at his table and ate his food that he bought with his money as a tax collector. Well, a judgmental person would never do that because all that food was bought with, with tax money. And right at the table, he repented in front of all the people. Ask Jesus specifically to change areas of weakness. Ask him. Move where you get conviction. Move where you have conviction. I do not push people into places when I don't perceive the Lord or conviction. I point them to the truth and I look to see if the truth is bearing fruit and then it's convicting them and compelling them to do something. They have to be following the Lord. They have to be following Jesus. You share the truth, but there's a difference. Let me understand. I can give you information, or I can, you need to. You understand? It's different. It's different. Meditate on his teachings. Relationship brings transformation, not modification. We're not adding Jesus to our lives. We are becoming like Jesus. Because we've died to our old life. Point number three, true fulfillment comes from knowing Jesus, not just following the rules. Some of us were looking, some people take up religion because they want a sense of greater significance. They want to connect with higher power. They want, listen, that's shallow. It's shallow. If you're just approaching Christianity because you like the ceremony and the idea of God and everything, but you don't ever step into the relationship, eventually you're going to peter out. Eventually you're just going to get stuck in a religious expression and experience, and you're not going to be connected to the actual church, which is in spirit. That's why the letter kills, but the spirit brings life. So here's an example. The rich young ruler, Mark 10. Let's go to Mark 10. We'll start on verse 17. I'm reading from my New King James, so if you don't understand me, I understand. <laughs> now as he was going out on the road, one came running and knelt before him and asked, Good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? Okay, so the rich, first, the rich young ruler is looking through the lens of good people and bad people. That's not a healthy lens. You're not going to have good relationships if you go through life looking at superficial lens. Good people, bad people. White people, black people. American, immigrant. You got to be careful with your labels. We're all created in the image of God. And if you're a good person, you weren't always. Careful. 
Why do you call me good? No one is good but the one that is God. Okay, he's exposing this man right now to himself. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And he answered and he said to him, Oh, teacher, all these things I kept from my youth. Then Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, One thing you lack. Go your way. Go home. Sell whatever you have. Give it to the poor, and you will have treasures in heaven. And then come, take up the cross, and follow me. But he was sad at this word. He went from, ha, huh, I've been keeping on, I'm doing all that stuff right. All right, come follow me. Well, wait a minute. Like, really? Come follow me. But he was sad and went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. He had great possessions. You see, he lived a life of principles. But when he got called into relationship, he hesitated. It showed an emptiness with the rules. You see, religion is man's way of trying to get to God. But relationship is God's way of trying to get the convicting work of the Holy Spirit into man. This is why the scripture says, the day is coming when I will take from them a heart of stone and I will give them a heart of flesh and I will write my laws upon their hearts. Because he wants relationship. Go beyond the song. Okay, just as an example, go beyond singing songs and go to trying to express your heart in the song. There's a difference. Every good song that was ever written, no matter what it was, what the genre was, there was an emotion behind that thing. A heart behind the song. Forget about the beat and the words. Just imagine with me for a second. There was an emotion, there was a heart that that song came out of. And so we're supposed to connect our hearts in worship. It's not about the song. Pursue the presence in worship. Go beyond singing songs. Seek a heart connection in worship. That's why sometimes we sing songs over and over. Because we're trying to give ourselves time to actually connect. And the leaders, who was leading the song, perceives that the Holy Spirit wants us to hang out in that spot because he's trying to connect people with his heart. He's trying to talk through the song. That's why we're singing, we're trying to connect with him, we're trying to actually worship. So sometimes we can't on a song and we say a verse, sometimes we sing a new song, it's not even up there, it's just some words that spontaneously come up and we just sing them over and over again. And when you enter in and you get into a place where you're doing that in a worshipful way, time just, it just, you know, they say time flies when you're having fun. Yeah. But man, when you're bored out of your mind, you're like, one Mississippi two, Mississippi three, Mississippi four, Mississippi five, Mississippi six, Mississippi seven, Mississippi eight, Mississippi, oh my gosh, it's been 60 seconds. Ah! But when you're having fun, when you're getting caught up in the presence of the Lord, man, you completely forget and get lost in his glory, and it doesn't matter, and you're like, oh man, we're done. Another way to walk in the fulfillment of that relationship, not just the rules, is having an attitude of gratitude. I heard that this morning when somebody shared. So that was one of my talking points. Regularly thanking God for the simple things. Somebody said this morning, I just thank God that I was able to breathe better this morning. I, I can say I, that has not been in my head. I haven't had a day where I'm like, man, I'm so glad I can breathe better today. And 
And I say that with no condemnation. It's like, oh. Spend quiet moments with Jesus resting without an agenda. You know what my devotion time looks like sometimes? Actually, most of the time, I'm going to show you. Ready? Love you, Jesus. And I just turn my affection, I turn my mind, and I just think of him. I don't have a punch list of all the things I have to pray for. I'm not thinking about the things I need to do later. It's just him. I'm not talking, I'm just listening. And sometimes I feel absolutely nothing, and then I get up and I get ready and I get outside and I get in my car, and immediately when I get in my car, presence of God. Immediately when I show up to work, presence of God. And my entire day is marked by Jesus through that. Then if he prompts me. And so a little secret tidbit, if you practice that and you actually have times of prayer when you are binding and loosing, you know, calling things you know, heaven on earth type of stuff and you're praying for your neighbor and all those things, those things should come after. And when you keep up to date with that, then when you come to church and you sit and pray, you don't get swamped with, oh my gosh, I didn't pray for these things. How many understand what I'm saying? Come on, is it? Is it right? It's been a while and then you sit and you go to a prayer meeting or you step into worship and all of a sudden, all the things that the Lord has been trying to get your attention with and you're like, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. And then you can't even rest with him. You can rest with him. So say this with me again. Relationship rules the rules. Ready one more time. Relationship rules the rules. You want to get you want his commandments to not be burdensome? Relationship. Just follow him and do what he tells you to do. Daily. And you will fall into it. It won't even be hard. Jesus, I thank you for the, your word this morning, for your presence, for how you touched me in the sound booth earlier. We thank you for the work you're doing in the children. And we say, have your way with our kids. Continue the work. Continue to build us into a people. Prepare us. Continue the foundation for the move and power of God that you're going to be doing the work and the move of God that's coming for this city. Build your foundation. Build your church. Prepare our hearts. Prepare our minds for what is to come. Break us out of living in a place of condemnation into a place of love, mercy, and grace. Break us out of a place of a critical spirit and judgmental attitudes to a place of compassion and understanding. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Next service starts at 11.30. They're usually different, so some of you are double dippers. We'll see you then.